Good morning, I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, to boldly go, William Shatner, on-screen icon of the final frontier for years, will finally get his chance to explore humanity's greatest unknown in reality. Just a few hours from now, we'll take you inside the final preparations for the Blue Origin launch, and of course, bring you the countdown forecast. New overnight opening up, major developments from the White House in the fight against COVID. The U.S. is now expected to reopen its borders with Canada and Mexico to tourists and those traveling for pleasure, but there's a catch we'll tell you about. Plus, the White House is now advising state governors to prepare to vaccinate children with a shot rollout potentially just weeks away. Also this morning, the stunning revelation surrounding the death of Gabby Petito. Autopsy results confirming the 22-year-old died by manual strangulation at least three weeks before her remains were discovered in a Wyoming national park. For the nationwide manhunt for Petito's fiance, Brian Laundrie, stands this morning. Plus, life hack. You've heard the advice time and time again from your mom and your doctor. Eat your greens. What exactly do they do for the human body? We're going to take a closer look at how these superfoods can lead to a longer, healthier life. Hmm. I have to admit, I still get that advice. I know, <laughs> I know. in my life, more <laughs> greens. Yeah, I do like kale and arugula, so I'm hoping those are on the list. I, they're green. We'll yeah, out. we'll All see. Right. Stay tuned. All right. We begin this morning, though, of course, with that historic rocket launch in West Texas. That's right. Actor William Shatner is set to become the oldest person to visit space when he blasts off aboard a Blue Origin rocket this morning. It will be the company's second manned trip after a successful launch in July took company founder Jeff Bezos and others more than 62 miles up past the internationally recognized boundary of space. Right now, you're looking at a live picture. You can see T-minus one hour, 58 minutes, and about four seconds. We have full coverage this morning, of course. Meteorologist Bill Cairns is following the weather conditions. But first, we have NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky on the ground in West Texas ahead of this launch. Morgan, good morning. So the launch was delayed a day because of high winds, but it looks like all systems are a go for this 10 a.m. launch this morning. What should we expect when they blast off, and is everything still looking okay? Everything is still looking great. Joe Savannah, good morning. And this should be a, really a carbon copy of what we saw back in late July when Jeff Bezos, his brother, Wally Funk, and Oliver Damon went up here from the West Texas desert in that first manned flight flew blue, for Blue Origin. And we are within that window now, the propellant being loaded into that rocket. The crew definitely awake at this point in time. They'll make their way towards that Blue Origin capsule here uh, sooner than later. Uh, and they'll climb inside for a, a 9 a.m. liftoff here local time in West Texas. This flight going to be about 11 minutes long, just like the first one. They'll experience three to four minutes of weightlessness there at the top, uh, just a cool 350,000 feet above the Earth's surface. And that's when that capsule will start its return back to the West Texas desert, having multiple parachutes deployed before what should be a soft landing uh, of about one mile an hour for a nice cushion here uh, in the West Texas desert. All systems are a go. The wind was the primary concern here. It was gusting upwards of 75 miles an hour the other day. Certainly not what you want to encounter for a uh, seamless flight. However, at this point in time, Blue Origin says that uh, the crew is ready, the ship is ready. Uh, and right now we're just waiting for the sunrise to have that final check of the weather uh, before they make this second manned journey for Blue Origin. Guys, Morgan, you know, this uh, launch has been getting perhaps above average attention because of <laughs> one of the passengers aboard the ship, Mr. Shatner. But we should note there are three others joining them. What else should we know about the crew joining Shatner on this launch? Yeah, this is a unique crew. You have, of course, 90-year-old William Shatner, Captain Kirk. You also have uh, Audrey Powers. She is a vice president for Blue Origin uh, in the Mission Control Department. So she will be uh, highly familiar with what's going on as that capsule uh, goes into the sky uh, and skims the edge of space. And then you have two tech executives Chris Boswiesen and Glenda Vries, uh, they are two paying customers. We don't know exactly how much they had to throw down to get that ticket on board <laughs> that Blue Origin flight, but we know estimates come in at around $250,000 a pop. Uh, pretty significant. Uh, both very familiar with the concept of space travel. They've worked uh, with aeronautics to some degree. Uh, so, you know, those three plus Captain Kirk... You have a pretty capable crowd here, guys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Morgan, you mentioned the price tag. Obviously out of reach for most of us, but I mean, they do keep saying the price is going to come down. Also, one of the unique things that they're doing is trying to reuse these rockets. So 
What does this high profile launch mean, especially if it's successful for the company in this new era of space tourism? Yeah, Blue Origin says this is all about just consistency and repetition, really, proving that they can do this successfully, reusing uh, not just the capsule, but also the rocket that takes them skyward. Uh, it's going to be the same one that was used back in late July uh, to take that first manned group up. Uh, of course, Time will tell how much more affordable those tickets to space can get, uh, but they're proving that in a time span of just a few months, they can have that first mission go up and then a second, and they're reusing the equipment that they have right here at hand. All Joe right. Savannah? Morgan, thank you so much. Very exciting stuff. We'll be checking back in with you. With that, let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Bill Karens, hello, welcome back. So how are we looking now this hour ahead of the launch? Yeah, it's interesting. If, if we want to go back to that live picture of the countdown, I've actually been watching that a little. There's like mm. a white sheet that is in front of the windows of the top of the capsule. And every now and then you see it blowing in the breeze a little bit. And you <laughs> can see it kind of moving. I've been kind of watching that and tracking that just to see if like how windy it is. There's no other flags really that are live in that shot that we've been watching this morning. And the winds are have really lowered in the last 24 hours. That's why as of now, it's a go. The one thing I have been watching, though, is the upper level winds. Now, the launch site is just south south of New Mexico. It's extreme West Texas, just north of Van Horn. On this map, the light blues is kind of a lighter wind. These are the winds where the jets fly. So this is what the, you know, we don't, at the surface, it's fine. But again, the rocket has to go all the way up into space. So we don't want strong winds to blow the rocket off course. The green, which is exiting, if I go through the next two hours, is slowly moving away from that X that I put on the map there. If it had the winds that were currently in Colorado, Kansas, or, you know, Nebraska, it would be canceled. But it looks like as as of now, even though the winds are strong, they're not extreme enough to cancel it. And as far as the surface goes, we also don't want to go up, obviously, in the rain or the clouds. You just saw the live picture there of the launch pad. It doesn't, there's no precipitation whatsoever. There are some clouds just to the south, and there was going to be streaming and bringing wet weather into Texas. But as of right now, things are a go. I mean, we're looking pretty good with clear skies. Uh, temperatures are in the 50s, and we have a light southwest breeze occasionally. And, you know, those upper level winds, I guess, you know, they have to make their calls. They know what the restrictions are for the rocket. They have their protocols and their own private forecasters on site there. And they're saying that it's a go as of now. No problems whatsoever. As far as the forecast, I want to catch everyone up because it is our Wednesday. And I promised Savannah for the rest of my life, I have to give her the weekend <laughs> forecast on Wednesday. So we are watching uh, pretty warm, unseasonably warm conditions in the eastern half of the country. There is all that rain. We've had thunderstorms moving through Oklahoma City and Dallas as we go throughout the morning. And then tomorrow, still wet weather in areas of Texas. But look how warm it is, though. D.C. at 82 degrees. In New England is in the mid-70s in the middle of October. And as far as the upcoming weekend forecast goes, we have to watch those strong storms on Friday. They're going to be in the Ohio Valley. Saturday, they go into areas of the northeast and northern New England. So those peak leaves, a lot of them are going to be coming down Saturday. Whatever is left of those gorgeous leaves in the Great Lakes in the northeast mm. will be perfect for a delightful end to the weekend. All right, look at that. Thank you, Bill. Is that a little pink on your tie, too? Uh, you got some stripage going on. I love it. Look, I have pink and stars and moons for the launch. I was quite impressed I with myself. The, I saw it. <laughs> All right, thanks, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right, new developments this morning in the fight against the coronavirus. White House officials are telling governors to start preparing to vaccinate children ages 5 to 11 by early November that's pending FDA approval. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer joins us now from L.A. with the latest. Miguel, good morning. Joe, good morning. Breaking overnight, the White House says it's time to reopen land borders for Americans coming in to, from Mexico and Canada. This as they also try to up the vaccinations here at home. This morning, America's signaling it's open for business from across the border again. The White House says it'll lift a 19-month ban for foreign travelers crossing land borders from both Canada and Mexico, but only for visitors who can prove they're fully vaccinated. The announcement paving the way for non-essential purposes, including separated families and tourists, to breathe life into border economies struggling due to COVID restrictions. This comes as 28 million children, 5 to 11 years old, could be getting shot 
shots into arms as early as November. That according to a call Tuesday between the White House and the nation's governors, with White House officials telling states to start preparing to vaccinate kids. I think all indications are hopefully uh, once the FDA completes its work that we'll see vaccine in kids after Halloween. With advisory committees for the FDA and CDC set to weigh in on pediatric vaccines in the next three weeks, the FDA could also clear the way for the first boosters for adults from Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. Moderna releasing data urging the FDA to authorize a half dose of its vaccine as a booster six months after the second dose. The FDA's advisory panel set to discuss those findings later this week. But even as attention shifts to whether boosters are needed, the FDA's acting commissioner tells NBC News the vaccines are working and they remain focused on the unvaccinated. It's more important than boosters. The current vaccines are protecting most people from hospitalization and deaths, the, the really bad outcomes. The government believes vaccine mandates may be a path to reaching those unvaccinated. They've met resistance in some areas, including Texas, where the governor has banned all mandates. In New York, a high-profile basketball battle, as the NBA's Brooklyn Nets announced that once the season starts, they'll play and practice without star player Kyrie Irving after his refusal to comply with New York's vaccine mandate. He has a choice to make, and, and, and he made his choice. Now, back to boosters. Of course, after the FDA meets on Thursday and Friday, the CDC will have to review their findings in their summary and make its own decision after that. Joe, back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you. A decision on a vaccine for younger kids could make a big impact, of course, on COVID inside schools. Across the country, schools have faced the challenge of quarantines, testing and masking protocols. And as we've seen in recent weeks, every school district is tackling this issue differently. NBC News correspondent Heidi Presbella joins us now outside an elementary school in Montgomery County, Maryland. Heidi, good morning. So I know there, this particular school district, nearly 5,000 students have had to quarantine. What's that been like for them? How's the school year still been going? Yes, yeah, Savannah, some parents calling it quarantine jail. Kids being sent home mm. for 10 days with no live instruction, whether they're positive or negative. And the parents say that it's exacerbating what has already been significant, steep learning losses. For instance, second graders seeing a 35 point drop in literacy, Savannah. And so this is a real problem, has been a real problem. Uh, just within the first week, about 2,000 kids quarantined. And here is what one of the PTA representatives told Told us. Many students with headaches or stomach aches or sniffles or sneezing uh, were being put into quarantine or um, sent home to get a negative test and then all those close contacts. So it was creating um, uh, not only challenges with the school system with having that many kids affected, but also just interpersonal relationships. And you ask, why is it happening? It's happening because the lack of availability and organization and logistics around testing in schools. All right. And I know the school you're at now is trying to reduce the number of students who need to quarantine. So tell us, how are they doing that while still, of course, trying to keep the virus out of the classroom? And the whole point of the quarantine is to keep kids safe. Yeah, well, two weeks in, when they had about 2,000 kids quarantined, they decided they needed to make a change. And so they made a big change, which was to bring in rapid testing centers into the schools physically. Now, the Department of Health and Human Services is providing the staff. I spoke with the principal here, and she says this has made a huge difference. So instead of having 2,000 kids a week quarantined, they've got only about 200. Now, mm, happening just wow. this week as well, Savannah, what they're doing is a new program to take it to the next level, which is called Test to Stay. And here is how that would work, according to the interim superintendent. We all need everything quick and uh, quickly. And, and I completely understand that because every single measure that we can put in place to keep our students in school, but to keep them there safely is key. And so I'll, I'll just say, well, one thing that the Test to Stay model will allow us is to be able to 
allow close contacts who were exposed to symptomatic individuals to stay in school as long as they continue to test negative. So Maryland can do this because they made a big investment earlier in the year in testing. So they have the testing supplies now, Savannah. They just mm -hmm. need the staff. And so how has this model worked elsewhere, test to stay? Do we have any indication if it's working? We do. Boston and the state of Massachusetts really have been leaders on this. They've even brought in the National Guard to help with test to stay. And here's how it works. You don't have to quarantine these kids who are exposed even to a positive child unless they test positive. So you're just testing them with repeated, frequent, rapid testing uh, tests. Now, this is not something that should be uh, unusual, according to epidemiologists who I talked to, Savannah, because they're doing this, for instance, in Europe. The big difference is that here we have fewer tests that have been approved by the FDA and we have more expensive tests. For instance, in Germany, you can get a huge batch of tests for $35 or under. So these are wow. really significant systemic problems that we need to figure out. All right, Heidi, of course, so much to watch for, especially as that coronavirus vaccine for kids may roll out soon. Heidi, thanks so much. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Uche Blackstock. So, doctor, we reported earlier White House officials are telling governors to start preparing to roll out the COVID vaccine for kids ages 5 to 11. So how do states start preparing for that now? Is this something that they've kind of gotten used to doing or is this a little different this time around? Uh, good morning, Joe. Thanks so much for having me. You know, I think the 5 to 11 demographic is going to need a different approach. They're going to need to uh, interact with pediatricians, family practice physicians, uh, as well as schools. Parents, uh, we know from surveying and polls, have a very different perspective on vaccinating younger children. They are more reserved and concerned about it. So we need those pediatricians and family physicians to really engage in outreach and education with families to encourage vaccination. All right, tomorrow, uh, the FDA is going to consider a booster for the Moderna vaccine. There have been a few cases of a rare heart condition, myocarditis, in young men who've received the Moderna vaccine. Would a booster increase the risk of getting this condition? Do we know? Is this something the FDA is going to look at? Right, Joe. So, so yeah, obviously, that is the concern. Um, the fact is that we don't really have the data yet to know whether a booster would increase the risk. We know right now uh, it's the, the incidence is between 70 um, to 300 cases per million of you know, young men receiving the vaccination to go on to develop myocarditis. It is generally pretty mild. Uh, patients don't necessarily need to be hospitalized, and they recover uneventfully, usually. Um, but this is some of the data that, that uh, the FDA will be reviewing uh, this week. Uh, we don't have anything definitive yet, but that is the concern with giving an additional booster. And Dr. Blackstock, on Friday, not only is the FDA going to look at a booster for Johnson & Johnson, they're also going to consider the possibility of mixing and matching COVID vaccines. What do doctors know about this so far, and what could come out of the hearing when it comes to this? Right. So the, so the mixing and matching studies are, are really important, um, especially, obviously, in areas where there is you know, scarcity of, of vaccinations. Um, but we need to know whether or not um, different types of vaccines, mRNA versus adenovirus platforms, could be given um, together. We know from some earlier studies that they have been successful. For example, the AstraZeneca vaccine, when followed by an mRNA vaccine, uh, patients have a very good immune response to it. So this, uh, really, this information may be a game changer in terms of giving different combinations of vaccines to patients. All right. Dr. Blackstock, as always, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, after days of cancellations and delays, Southwest Airlines is inching back to more normal operations as the carrier's CEO denies claims the disruption was caused by staff protesting the company's vaccine requirement. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders is at Fort Lauderdale International Airport. Hey, Carrie, good morning. Well, good morning, Savannah. I'm here at the airport where at this airport, all of Southwest flights, all 40, show that they're on time. Across the country, FlightAware shows 122 flights are delayed, 15 are canceled. That is a sharp decline from what Southwest passengers have had to go through for almost a week now. This morning, Southwest CEO says most of their crews are now finally in position to resume normal flight operations. This after a nightmarish holiday weekend for customers wondering what went wrong. It was just one thing after another after another. 
Southwest blames bad weather in Florida as the critical trigger to the massive disruptions. What happened to Southwest more acute than impacts at other airlines. Because they don't have hubs with extra planes laying around that are one flight away, if there is a cancellation, the cascading effects of any operational inefficiency simply get out of control. The pilots union says the more than 2,400 canceled flights had nothing to do with pilots protesting the federal vaccine mandate, which the airline said it would be following shortly before the trouble began. Southwest CEO defending the mandate. The objective here obviously is to improve health and safety, uh, not for people to lose their job. That's not what uh, was at issue with Southwest uh, over the weekend. Still, on Tuesday, continued problems. More than 90 cancellations and 1,200 plus delays. That's over 35% of the airline's scheduled flights. Since the cancellations began, Southwest has repeatedly apologized, telling NBC News they're offering all affected customers the option to rebook without cost. Our flight was canceled. But nurse Sarah Bowsma says it's too little too late. After two canceled Southwest flights and a hospital shift she could not skip, Sarah rented a car and drove her family with a hotel stay from Orlando to Nashville. The average family can't just spend $2,000 unexpectedly to get home. Um, but that's what I had to do and that's what thousands of other people had to do also. Southwest customers who had their flights canceled are due a refund. That's important to understand that you do not have to accept under federal law a voucher for a future flight. At the same time, Southwest Airlines says those passengers who had incurred costs, as we just heard there, for renting cars and hotels, if you can provide the documentation, they will work with you. Finally, Southwest Airlines says going forward as we head into the holidays, they promise to do better. Savannah? All right, let's hope so, because what a mess. Carrie, thank you so much. Firefighters this morning are battling a growing wildfire in California that's forcing evacuations just north of Santa Barbara. The Alisaw fire so far has spread to more than 13,000 acres, with just 5% of it contained. Part of historic Highway 101 has also been shut down. The U.S. Forest Service says around 600 firefighters are battling the flames. Utility companies in the state have shut off electricity in an effort to prevent more fires from igniting. The cause of this fire, not yet known. And coming up, inside Putin's war on the last independent journalist in Russia. Their stories and struggles with one of the world's most powerful leaders. Next. Last week, journalists Dmitry Muratov from Russia and Maria Reza from the Philippines won the Nobel Peace Prize for defending free press. Hours after that announcement, Russian authorities designated several publications and journalists as foreign agents, those who receive foreign funding. As NBC News reporter Matt Bodner explains, it's just one way the country is targeting independent reporting. Savannah, Joe, good morning. Well, obviously, a lot of ink has been spilled over the crackdown on the Russian political opposition, the assassination attempt on Alexei Navalny, and, and the brutal crackdown on protesters earlier this year. But there's actually a much larger campaign being waged in a much more benign manner, using, using laws rather than brute force, and specifically targeting journalists and other civil society groups. And we spoke with some of the victims. Let's take a look. Russia is in the midst of the largest crackdown on dissent since the Soviet era. The political opposition has been more or less decimated, and now independent journalists say that the state is coming after them, using a law regulating the activities of foreign agents. At first, the law was used against foreign media outlets like Voice of America. But last year, the Russian government began to use it against independent Russian media outlets. The Kremlin says they are fighting foreign influence in Russian politics, but independent Russian journalists say this isn't true. It's not uh, the case about receiving money from abroad, you know. It's uh, the law to silence uh, all the ind independent voices. Sonia Greisman is one of dozens of journalists who the Russian government has declared foreign agents, essentially a blacklisting label that classifies them as hostile to the state. Groisman started a podcast documenting life as a foreign agent. She must regularly file financial reports, and anything that she writes online must come with a disclaimer, 
Failure to do so could result in criminal prosecution. So it's all about the disclaimer. Well, it's not only about a disclaimer. It's all about uh, living humiliating life. It's not just individuals who are targeted. Larger independent news organizations have also been added to the foreign agent list. The whole point of this foreign agent law uh, is to uh, crush you under uh, the weight of uh, bureaucracy. Alexei Kovalyov is an editor at Medusa, one of Russia's most widely read independent news sites. They were declared foreign agents earlier this year. It was devastating. I mean, we were just shell-shocked. The designation destroyed their advertising model and still scares away potential sources. I guess the point is to drive us out of business and us individually to drive us out of the country because it's what's happening now. People are fleeing. You know, even if you are the most hardened reporter, you still have family. You know, our families didn't sign up for this. So one of the things that Alexei said to me that really stuck out is, is this observation that in the past month, the number of individuals and organizations on this foreign agent list has nearly doubled, and it shows no signs of, of slowing down at all. In his own words, this machine does not have a reverse gear. So the situation looks like it's only going to get worse and worse, and, and really there's no, there's no bottom to reach at this point. Back to you guys. All right, Matt, thanks. Let's take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. Ali Aruzi is back with us this hour from London. Hey there. Good morning, guys. Well, the UK and the EU may be divorced, but they're heading towards a new big Brexit battle over Northern Ireland, the only part of the United Kingdom to share a border with an EU country, and that country is Ireland. The UK is demanding an overhaul of an agreement on trade rules for Northern Ireland, which was one of the most contentious and complicated parts of the Brexit deal. In Holland, which was the first country in in the world to legalize gay marriage, the prime minister there says that the 17-year-old crown princess can choose to marry someone of any gender and it won't affect her rights to the throne. The crown princess hasn't spoken about the subject and little is known about her private life. And finally, police in Peru went to extreme lengths to save a pigeon trapped on a high voltage cable. They sent up a drone, some sticky tape, and a knife to save the pigeon and get what? it back down. Hopefully, it didn't fly back up after it was rescued. No kidding. That's a, some MacGyver type yeah, action. You say sticky on tape and a knife pigeon. and a drone? What? <laughs> it worked. Wow, whoever was flying that drone. Yeah. Well, I don't know the knew, mechanics of it, but with the knife training. was pointing at the thing, the, <laughs> they were impressed. part of getting the license yeah. as pigeon rescues. Yeah. Allie, thank you. <laughs> All right, coming up, her official cause of death, manual strangulation. Yeah, inside the coroner's report on Gabby Petito and the latest on the nationwide manhunt for her fiancé, Brian Laundry, up next. Welcome back. Two of the biggest music festivals just announced they won't require vaccines in 2022. Coachella and Stagecoach posted the new policies on Instagram, citing low transmission data and successful safety protocols at other music festivals. It's a major reversal from the vaccine mandate Coachella's parent company, AEG Presents, announced in August. Festival goers excuse me, will still have to present a negative COVID test within 72 hours of the event or proof of vaccination. Both Coachella and Stagecoach are scheduled to take place in April after both were canceled in 2020 and 2021. I remember back at the start of COVID, they just had pushed it from April to October, and that obviously didn't happen. Like so many things. Exactly, yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Mm -hmm. This morning, we know more about the tragic and violent death of 22-year-old Gabby Petito. A Wyoming coroner declared she died by strangulation, releasing her autopsy results yesterday. This comes as police continue to search for her fiancé, Brian Laundry, the only person of interest in the case. NBC News correspondent Kristen Dahlgren joins us now with the latest on the search. Kristen, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. Yeah, the case of Gabby Petito is one that has touched so many people. As you said, the coroner has now said it was strangulation at somebody else's hands. So he couldn't say any more per Wyoming statute, and a lot of other questions remain. This morning, new details in the death of Gabby Petito, the Teton County coroner revealing how she died. We hereby find the cause and manner of death to be 
the cause death by strangulation and manner is homicide. The official report noting her cause of death as manual strangulation or throttling. The coroner says they believe Petito died three to four weeks before her body was found in the Wyoming wilderness in September. The timeline would put the 22-year-old's death somewhere around the last week of August. In a situation like this, nothing is obvious. And so uh, the cause of death required investigation. Per Wyoming statute, the coroner could not release more specifics about the autopsy findings. But he did say Petito was not pregnant. Petito's boyfriend, Brian Laundrie, has been a person of interest in Petito's disappearance after returning home to Florida alone following the couple's road trip. Laundrie was last seen in mid-September, vanishing after his parents said he went hiking in a nearby nature reserve. On August 12th, Moab police stopped Petito and Laundry after reports of a domestic dispute. Charges were never filed in the incident, but Laundry is facing fraud charges for unauthorized use of a debit card. An attorney for Laundry noting in a statement, while Brian Laundry is currently charged with the unauthorized use of a debit card belonging to Gabby, Brian is only considered a person of interest in relation to Gabby Petito's demise. The case has captured the attention of the nation, and memorials for Gabby continue to grow. Petito's mother and stepfather visiting one in their hometown late Tuesday, as the quest for answers and for justice continues. Now, the coroner sidestepped questions to him about who might be responsible for Petito's death. He said that's up to investigators. But he did say one thing, guys, that a lot of people are reading into. He was talking about the media attention in this case. And he said this is only one of many deaths around the country of people who are involved in domestic violence. That is a clear reference to physical violence by a partner. So a lot of people looking at that. Brian Laundry, though, today. Day remains a person of interest. He has not been named a suspect in this case. Back to you. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Coming up, a major new message from the FDA to food manufacturers this morning. Start limiting the salt. Inside the administration's latest push to curb heart disease numbers in the U.S. Next. Time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Silvana Hanau is back this hour. Hey there. Good morning. Hasbro CEO Brian Goldner has died at 58 years old, just two days after he stepped down from the toy maker to take medical leave. Goldner disclosed last year that he has been receiving treatment for prostate cancer since 2014. He had been CEO since 2008, but began working at the toy maker in 2000. While at Hasbro, Goldner's tenure was focused on leveraging the company's brands across entertainment, successfully growing the business beyond toys and games into television, movies, and digital gaming. A record 4.3 million people quit their jobs in August, led by bar and restaurant employees, as well as retail staff. The quits rate rose 2.9% from 2.7% in July, according to the Labor Department's Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. Historically, quits are viewed as a level of confidence from workers who feel comfortable finding a job elsewhere. Though the quits rate in August likely surged, along with the rise in COVID-19 cases, along with childcare issues. And the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted 30% of Americans to change when they plan on retiring. That's according to a recent survey from Northwestern Mutual, which found that of those respondents, about one-fifth said they plan to retire later than they did before the pandemic, while about one-tenth said they plan on retiring earlier. Roughly 40% of those delaying their retirement date plan to do so by three to five years, but 35% plan to put off retirement for more than 10 years. Back to you. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Solana. Sure. We got breaking news this morning. In an effort to get the nation eating better, <laughs> the FDA is calling on food manufacturers and restaurants to slash the amount of salt in their products. That's right. The goal is to get Americans to lower their sodium intake to reduce the rate of heart disease, which is the country's number one killer. NBC News senior Washington correspondent Hallie Jackson reports. Hey there, Savannah and Joe. Good morning to the both of you. The FDA today is taking a very big step that's been years in the making. New guidelines for less sodium and, they hope, better health. A major move new this morning from the FDA to slash salt in what you buy at the grocery store or eat at restaurants. It's the excess sodium in people's diet in this country from toddlers 
on up is causing disease and poor health. We believe that sodium can be reduced in a way that people will hardly notice. Americans should consume about 2,300 milligrams of sodium each day. That's about a teaspoon of salt. Right now, most of us eat way more than that, 3,400 milligrams on average. But the FDA's new guidelines for processed, packaged, and prepared foods hopes to lower that number to 3,000 milligrams a day over the next two and a half years. That would cut out the equivalent of 60 teaspoons of salt per person every year. Most of the sodium does not come from a salt shaker. It comes from the food, the processed food people are eating, uh, the restaurant meals they're consuming. And there's no way you can take it out of that tomato sauce or that salad dressing. It's already in there. Do you think people will notice a difference in how their food tastes? If we do it gradually, I think it'll be acceptable. Doctors unanimous. Less sodium means less hypertension and less heart disease. The move by the FDA is a great leap forward. In public health, we believe in prevention. The new recommendations, aimed at more than 160 categories for food manufacturers, restaurants, and food service operators, from dairy to bread to baby food. The National Restaurant Association telling NBC, while we are hopeful the guidance incorporates our suggestions, the restaurant industry continues to provide options to address customers' desires and health needs. Other food industry groups have questioned the expense. For certain foods, it may be very challenging. For many foods, it may not be that technically difficult. It may be expensive, but it is nowhere near the toll that's taking on the American public in terms of disease. Some big international companies are already lowering sodium to comply with recommendations in other countries. And ultimately, the FDA believes people want healthier food, that it's driven by the consumer. The idea here is to do this really slowly, gradually, over many years, so that all of our taste buds adjust, and you may not even really notice that the food you're eating is less salty. Joe, Savannah, back to you. All right, Hallie Jackson, thanks so much. Now to a major reversal in the medical community over lowering the risk of heart attacks and stroke. Yeah, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force now says people over the age of 60 should not start taking daily doses of aspirin to combat heart attacks, citing potential harm like internal bleeding. NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres explains. So this comes from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which issued a draft recommendation changing previous guidance that called for a daily low dose of aspirin for those 50 and older who are at a high risk of heart disease or stroke. These new recommendations now say adults in their 40s and 50s should only take daily aspirin if their doctors recommend it. But the biggest change, adults 60 and older should not take daily aspirin if they haven't had a prior heart attack or stroke. The task force says the potential side effects, mainly bleeding, outweigh the benefits for them. All right. Thank you, Dr. Torres. And the last time the task force updated its recommendation for daily aspirin use was in 2016 when it said the decision to take it up, take it was up to individuals. Both the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association updated their guidelines in 2019, no longer recommending aspirin use. Mm. Coming up, the not-so-secret hack for a longer life. Yeah, how a steady diet of super healthy greens can help keep you in tip-top shape. That's next. Two decades ago, National Geographic explorer Dan Buettner identified the seven places around the world where people live the longest and healthiest lives. NBC's Cynthia McFadden spoke to him about the secrets to longevity that may be closer to home than you think and hiding in the weeds. Well, hey, there, this is a story of unintended consequences. When Dan Buettner, the globetrotting National Geographic correspondent, came to a screeching halt due to COVID traveling restrictions, he decided to take a road trip across to America. Long a critic of the so-called American diet, heavy on meat, sugar, salt, and processed foods, he discovered many long-forgotten American traditions and foods that he says could help us live at least six years longer. We start in Wisconsin with a forager chef who uses things he finds in the woods, things many of us may call weeds to make dinner. Weed is like a grocery store in a farm field. This is Alan Burgos' produce aisle. Oh, here's a perfect little cluster. But out here, everything is free. 
on this sprawling 300-acre farm in northern Wisconsin, he's not picking the crops, but the weeds growing wild. There's just something about getting on your hands and knees and picking food off the ground. It's primal, he says, an instinct that runs deep in all of our DNA. 95% of all of the people who have ever lived have been foragers. Every single person on the planet is descended from a forager. Every single person. Our bodies want us to find food. So that's we get that rush of dopamine. It never gets old. But Burgo may have stumbled across something else out here in the woods. Not only the secret to good eating, it may hold the secret to living to 100. You might say Dan Butner is a forager as well. And how many tomatoes? For two decades, he's scoured the earth, <laughs> learning the secrets of the longest-lived people. Okay, done. It's only about 20% of how long you live is your genes. The other 80% is something else. Dan and his team found that something else in the blue zones. And he's taken us there. Remote places like Ikaria, Sardinia, <laughs> and Akoya. They don't have any superfoods. There's not any magical pill or supplement you're going to take. They were essentially eating whole food, plant-based, grains, greens, tubers, nuts, and the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world. Beans! beans. <laughs> I got you trained. <laughs> hey, this is the secret of longevity right here, these little beans. This year, 750,000 people will die needlessly from eating the standard American diet. And those aren't my numbers, they come from the CDC. All right, what's the standard American diet? On average, we eat about 270 pounds of meat, about 650 pounds of dairy, about 150 pounds of sugar. In blue zones where people are living a long time, they do eat meat, but only five times per month. And a portion about the size of a deck of cards. A celebratory food that people have occasionally. Unfortunately, that's not the way we eat. But when he took that road trip across America last year, he discovered some long forgotten but uniquely American ways of eating. It's not only ingenious, but it's also blue zone healthy. It's this great treasure troll that somehow we've forgotten to look at. Over the next several months, Dan will introduce us to a farmer in South Carolina rescuing the forgotten rice of his slave ancestors and an open fire chef resurrecting the foods the pilgrims and Native Americans shared. And then there's the forager chef who's cooked in some of the Midwest's finest restaurants but now gathers baskets full of caterpillar nosh and turns them into gourmet meals. You learn one plant, you learn one mushroom, you will never forget that plant or mushroom. And every time you see it, the excitement never dies. Enough talking, can we try it? It's mushrooms and rice and nuts, and there's no lamb. Wow. I would argue it tastes, if not as good, Oh, it's Maybe delicious. Better. Mostly American seasoned weeds with Roundup. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer salt and a little bit of mushroom. <laughs> His wild green cakes use the weeds that he's gathered, but they'll also work with greens you can buy at the farm stand or the grocery store. Kind of a weed slider. It's, it is exact, it is a weed slider. <laughs> there is so much genius in there that you, you don't miss the meat at all. It is delicious. A whole food plant-based diet would add at least six extra years of life expectancy to America. What are you doing? So these are milkweed pods. Ah, uh, really? Yes. These fields are filled with milkweed. Oh, look at this. I treat them like okra, and I fry them in a little bit of cornmeal. I will eat pretty much anything fried. Another weed. You know what you're doing. A little bit like okra. There are so many fantastic plant-based sources of food that are not only cheap, in this case, free, and all you need is a little bit of culinary genius, the same effort that would be put on a steak or a pork chop, and you transfer that, and it produces absolute magic that's not only more delicious, but will help you live to 100. Can I have another one, please? Mm -hmm. Guys, back to you. All right, so no salt. Eat weeds. Yeah. <laughs> and don't take aspirin, <laughs> don't take aspirin I think. Aspirin all right. I think we got it all wrapped up for you. <laughs> yeah. Now you know how to live longer. I hope you've enjoyed this Piece last segment of the show. <laughs> That's it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now.
Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.